His first guy was Anthony Bruno and Delicato, and he was the guy that opened the door for Tommy Karate to come into the Bonanno family. Now, Delicato was known as Whack Whack on the streets because he could kill without hesitation. He was tall and muscular and had these dark good looks and a smile that attracted a lot of women. He started losing his hair early because of his vanity. He was one of the very first men in New York area to try a hair transplant. If you're, if you're of a certain age, you remember when Frank Sinatra made all the headlines because he got a hair transplant. Lefty Rosenthal out in uh, Las Vegas, he got a hair transplant. Well, hey, guys, it's good to be back here in the studio. Gangland Wire, Gary Jenkins here. Uh, you know, I recently got the Philip Carlo book. I'm kind of excited about this story. Got this book, and I see it back over, over my shoulder here, about Tommy Karate Patera. It's titled The Butcher, and it's a very detailed look at the life of this notorious mafia enforcer, hitman, and all-around tough guy. I mean, they didn't call, call, him, call him Tommy Karate for nothing. He's kind of the uh, kind of a guy that a low level mobster might, you know, they had a delinquent gambler and they would uh, loan shark customer. And, and so they'd go to him and say, you know, Tommy Karate's in on this. He gets a piece of this. You don't really want me to tell him that you're not paying, do you? And they'll go, oh, OK. So Tommy Karate was born to the life. I'm telling you, he was born to the life. Uh, you might check out my other show that I did um, a couple months ago about some more about his early life. I didn't really go into it quite the detail, a little more of an overview, glossing over, but I got in, I'm going into detail about his life over a series, using this book over a series of shows. But what I did report before, or what I did not report before, was that his first guy was Anthony Bruno and Delicato, and he was the guy that opened the door for Tommy Karate to come into the Bonanno family. Now, Delicato was known as Whack Whack on the streets because he could kill without hesitation. He was tall and muscular and had these dark good looks and a smile that attracted a lot of women. He started losing his hair early because of his vanity. He was one of the very first men in New York area to try a hair transplant. If you're if you're of a certain age, you remember when Frank Sinatra made all the headlines because he got a hair transplant. Lefty Rosenthal out in uh, Las Vegas, he got a hair transplant. Quack Quack and Delicato was a heavy, heavy cocaine user. I mean, you know, those early days of cocaine, if you were you know, you were among the heavy hitters and slick people and the uh, fast and the furious people, you used cocaine. And, and it was a party drug at the time. And uh, now, his father was Sonny Red in Delicato, and his uncle, Joe in Delicato, and they were pretty important capos in the Bonanno family, and they always looked out for him, and, and they actually sent him to drug rehab once or twice, I'm not sure how many times, but you know, Whack Whack and Delicato lived the usual life of a cokehead. They'd go into rehab, come back out all healthy and fit, but slowly and surely he'd fall back into his addiction. I don't know if you got any relatives like this or friends, you know what the deal is. Now, um, when Whack Whack and Delicato and Tommy Karate first met, they kind of felt an instant connection, according to Philip Carlo. And they, because they both embraced this philosophy that society's rules were not near as important as the mafia rules. Tom, Whack Whack Bruno took Tommy under his wing and taught him the ropes. Bruno was already schooled in making a body disappear, and this is where Tommy learned about this dismembering. Like Roy DeMeo, I don't know, maybe Roy DeMeo learned it from the same people, but like Roy DeMeo, Bruno had learned the butcher's method of separating limbs from the body trunks and knew just where to cut through the bone and the cartilage. You know, it's not easy. That's not always an easy thing to do. They perfected a cutting a body into six pieces and burying it in separate places around Brooklyn. And, and I know that said that Tommy Karate would always cut off the head and bury it someplace way apart from the body. You know, he's going to end up putting a lot of parts in a William T. Davis wildlife refuge on Staten Island. And we'll get more into that later on. Not in this show, though. I'm going to I'll deal with that later. Now, I probably said that I probably said this before, but Tommy Patera was born and bred Graves in a Brooklyn area boy who looked at Bonanno Capos like Joe Massino and Anthony Sparrow as his heroes. And they became his mentors later on in life. During his Tommy's formative years, the, the Bonanno family had a split. Now by his formative years, I mean his formative years 
in the mob. The Bonanno family had a split. The old boss, Carmine Galente, was murdered, and that brought on a war between Bonanno fac- factions. Joe Bacino put together a team to take out three Bonanno capos that refused to make peace and allow Phil Rostelli to take over the Bonanno family. This is the murder of three capos, a really famous murder. If you don't know it, just Google the murder of three capos. You'll find a lot about it. Now, Bruno Indelicato's father was Sonny Red Indelicato, and he was one of those capos. He was one of those captains. And he was murdered along with Philip Giassone and Big Trin Trinchera. Uh, this put Bruno Whack Whack and Delicato on the run. His father was killed. He was uh, actually, he was out, you know, because they killed his father. He took his friend, Tommy Patera, into hiding. They barricaded themselves in a remote Long Island house. Now, Tommy Karate, you know, this is a guy that's always prepared. He's cool headed. You know, uh, uh, Whack Whack would have been on cocaine and he would have been emotional about this thing. Tommy Karate was not emotional and he was a planner. He brought a duffel bag filled with guns. Uh, Philip Carlo uh, claims that while Whack Whack bargained for his life, you know, running out to pay phones and calling people, and and he's got to like somehow get himself back in and and assure them that he's not going to take revenge for his father's death. While he was doing that with Joe Massino, uh, Tommy Karate Patera was methodically taking apart and cleaning and oiling his guns over and over again. Now this guy, this is the guy you want to go to war with. Uh, Bruno made peace, Whack Whack made peace, and he agreed to let his father's murder slide for the good of the family and for his own personal good, because it was either that or, or he had to go into hiding the rest of his life or get killed himself. Uh, he and Tommy returned to the streets of Brooklyn over the next few years. Whack Whack and Delicato kept using cocaine to excess and partying more and more, and, and he started spending a lot more time in that crazy cocaine world of beautiful coke whores and and tons of cocaine from Columbia down in Miami and Tommy Karate Patera was a guy who prided himself on having a physically fit body having a disciplined lifestyle and his martial arts and and he really lost respect for his friend Whack Whack and Delicato over these years. Anthony Sparrow was well liked and, and a really successful Bonanno captain and he took to, and he took notice of young Tommy Patera as Whack Whack went deeper into the cocaine haze, Spiro drew Tommy into his crew. You know, uh, one thing about uh, Anthony Sparrow, he he had a big fireworks company. And, and you know, John Gotti is well known for his yearly fireworks displays and Benson Hurst. Well, before him, he actually was copying off of Anthony Sparrow, put on a really large Fourth of July party on Bath Avenue. And and he put on an amazing fireworks show for the neighborhood and provided enough feed they uh, enough food, they say, to feed all of Bensonhurst. And he also, he had a multi-million dollar fireworks business anyway. And you know what's interesting? I don't know if you notice, if you around this mob stuff, these guys, a lot of them like this fireworks business. There's a lot of them in the fireworks business. And, and I ask, and in Kansas City, we've got several mob associates or mob members, actually, that are in the fireworks business. There's fireworks stands and a guy that in the know told me, he said, well, he said they make about a hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars every season, every fireworks season. Plus it's primarily been a cash business. Now that's changing now after COVID, everybody's using credit cards, but for a long time, that's been a, a like a hundred percent almost cash business and mob guys love cash businesses like bars and casinos and, and, Anything that gets a lot of cash in, into it, because you can wash your own money through. There's a lot of ways to avoid paying taxes when you got a lot of cash coming through. So they like that fireworks business. And that's why I never could figure out why I was going to notice it. So that's a, just a small part of the entire Tommy Karate Patera story. And I'll get back to more later. Uh, like, for example, the time the DEA found his mob graveyard at the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge in Staten Island. Thanks a lot, guys. And don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles. And if you have PTSD, be sure and go to the VA website and find that hotline number. If you have a relative or somebody that's been in the military has got PTSD problems, go to that VA website and, and get that hotline number. There's a lot of help available there. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, guys.